here. So uh, today we'll be talking about variant data in ViewPathDB. Um, I will be presenting a portion of the webinar. I'm Omar Harb and I direct a scientific outreach and education for the um, uh, ViewPathDB uh, resources. Uh, I'll be joined today by Catherine Crouch, who is based at the University of Glasgow. Uh, and she's a, um, one of the key um, uh, developers in the group, but also uh, a co-leader of the TriTrip project. And she will be um, taking over uh, halfway through and discussing uh, copy number variation data in the database and, and how you can uh, query it and work with it. So um, in general, when we take um, uh, you know, resequence data or sequencing data from uh, high throughput sequencing experiments, um, and in most cases, what you do is you take this data and you align it to your reference genome. And then what you do, you can do many things with these alignments. Uh, we do a couple of things with them. One is we, we take the alignments and, and use the aligned reads and the locations where they're aligned for um, determine, to determining, determining uh, C and V, or copy number variation. And this is what Catherine will be talking about. Um, we also take these aligned reads and you can look at them and determine uh, using obviously different uh, programs and algorithms, you can look at them and determine if there are any polymorphisms or mutations or changes, um, uh, variations uh, in the sequence compared to the reference. And of course, if you have sequence from many, many isolates, you can align all of them to the reference. And based on their alignment to the reference, you can infer the differences between the different uh, isolates. So um, let me double check the questions. Okay, so there's some questions coming in. We will um, we will try and answer them uh, uh, as they come in. Uh, somebody's asking about the CMV pipeline. I'm sure we're, we're happy to share what we do, and, and obviously if that's useful for you. Uh, somebody has having issues with audio. I apologize. I think the audio is working for most people. Um, so um, if that doesn't work, obviously the recording will be available, and hopefully the the audio will start working for you soon. So uh, when we talk about single nucleotide polymorphisms. Um, you know, we're talking about a genetic variation and each SNP is, is a single change in one nucleotide, okay? And there are different kinds of SNPs, but in general, they can be divided into synonymous um, and non-synonymous uh, uh, and non-coding SNPs, okay? And each of these obviously denote different things. Non-coding is obviously clear, they're non-coding regions. Um, and so they're just genetic variation, single nucleotide changes in, uh, in um, non-coding regions, so outside of genes. Uh, synonymous mutations are changes that do not affect the amino acid that a codon, uh, you know, if that changes in a codon, it's not actually affecting um, the amino acid that that codon codes for. Uh, these are usually called uh, silent mutations as well. And then non-synonymous mutations is a nucleotide change which results in an amino acid change. So it's, it's disrupting or changing the codon. So now it's a codon that represents another um, uh, amino acid. And this could be, uh, these are often referred to as um, um, uh, missense mutations, which are ones that cause a change in amino acid. Of course, you can have a mutation that would change the codon to become a stop codon, right? So that's technically also a non-synonymous mutation, but it's typically referred to as a nonsense uh, mutation. And here's a, uh, just as a, a reminder of, of basic biology, uh, but here's a codon for, um, for lysine all the way on the left here. Uh, you'll see the, the DNA is a TTC, AAG, and, and RNA. Uh, so a silent mutation or a synonymous mutation is where you have a change in your, in your um, wobble um, nucleotide, obviously. So you have a, a, a change from a C to a T, but it still codes for a lysine. Okay, so the, the tRNA still recognizes this, the, the lysine tRNA still recognizes this as, as a, a lysine codon. Um, a nonsense one, obviously, is will change that uh, TTC into um, something that represents a, T, uh, a stop codon, like an a, a UAG. And so that's then a stop codon. And then the missense ones are mutations that occur in the, um, in the other positions of the codon that result in changing the amino acid. So in this case, uh, a change to a C uh, in the second position uh, uh, starts now coding for an arginine, and a change to a G, uh, at least at the DNA level, uh, in the second position uh, results in a uh, three amine. Okay, so those are the basic ideas. But the bottom line is that you're looking, you know, changes that are non-synonymous are ones that are um, that are causing 
something dramatic in the protein to the point where it's probably causing a change in an amino acid or a stop codon. And these are things that could potentially affect the function of the protein, whereas silent ones are ones that uh, should not affect the, the function of a protein because there's the same amino acid uh, in there. Um, there may be other effects, but the bottom line in terms of the protein itself, uh, it'll, it'll not affect the, the actual amino acid sequence. And non-coding mutations, uh, which are not represented obviously in this graph because they don't, um, they're not in codons that represent amino acids. Uh, often, you know, many people ignore these, but these could be quite interesting, especially if they occur in regulatory elements. So if they're an upstream of a gene in a, a transcription factor binding site and you're causing mutations that result in a transcription factor not binding anymore, so that's obviously a, a, a pretty critical um, mutation that could have some, some um, downstream effect. So there are a few things to think about when uh, you're considering SNPs. And these are things we actually incorporate in our searches. And I will demo some searches in a, in a couple of seconds, which will uh, show you these, diff these different parameters that you can, you can change as you ask questions um, about the underlying SNP data. So, um, so one, one question you have to ask yourself is, is can a SNP be called at a particular position, okay, based on the data? And, and so if you don't have enough sequencing reads from a particular strain at a particular position, right, then at some point you're going to start getting unreliable results, right? And so you have to ask, well, can I really call a SNP in that position? And what we do uh, in our pipeline, and that's fairly standard, is if, if there are less than five reads that align to a particular nucleotide, then we discard that information for that nucleotide from that strain. So we, we are not able to call a SNP in that location. Um, the other question is, um, um, the other question is you want to ask yourself is if you're looking at a, a population, a number of samples, is you may want to ask yourself, well, um, how many of the samples in my population had enough reads to call a SNP at a particular position. So if I'm interested in a, in a SNP at position two of a gene, right, this is hypothetical, and I'm looking at 10 isolates, um, and I'm interested in finding, is, a, is there a SNP at position two in these 10 isolates? So if only one of the isolates had sufficient sequence at that position to give you reliable results, right, then you know, you're not actually querying the 10. You're only asking a question about the one and the other ones, you, we don't have data for it. And so this is another parameter which you can actually use to increase the stringency of the results. And we'll, we'll demo this and hopefully it'll become more clear as we, as we talk about it. And I have a graphic on the next page, which I will detail this a little bit more. The other question is, what is the frequency of the reads that align to that particular um, uh, SNP or that particular location? Um, and so, and the way to think about this, uh, and again, I'll demo, I'll show it in the next slide, but um, if you're talking about a haploid organism in a perfect world, uh, if you sequence a strain that has a SNP at a particular position, position that's different from the reference, that, uh, you know, in a perfect world, 100% of your reads should contain that particular SNP, okay? And we'll, we'll, we'll discuss this again later on. Um, and then the other question is, how many of your samples actually have a SNP at that position? And that's often referred to as the minor and major allele frequency. Um, and those are, we do have those parameters uh, as well available to you in our searches. So quickly, here's an example of an aligned, a bunch of aligned reads. So this is sequence from, from aligned reads. They've been aligned uh, to a particular location. And this is just to demo um, these different um, uh, situations. So here is a situation uh, where these are 10, uh, different um, uh, sequencing reads for one isolate. So we're calling it isolate X here. So at this position here, there are 10 reads they aligned and they all have a SNP at that position. Okay, so the read frequency is 100%. Okay, if we go down to this position and you count these up, there are only four. So in this case, the read frequency, there are four A's and the rest are G's, right? And so these four A's would be your, your polymorphism. And so in this case, um, the read frequency for the A's is 40% and the read frequency for the G's is 60%, okay? So this is something you may, you may see in a, in a potentially a diploid situation. Um, and then here's a situation where, uh, you know, for this particular position from this isolate, we only have one, two, three, four reads that have sequence in this position. So this is four, this is below our threshold. So we will not call a SNP in this position, right? So, so from this isolate, isolate X, we will have no data for this position of, um, of this particular sequence, okay? 
So hopefully this is a little bit clearer, but I think this will, as we as we go through the demos, uh, this will become even um, even clearer. I'm going to pause for a second and see if there are any questions that we should answer now. Yeah, so we're talking, so there's a question when you say if more than five reads are, uh, we're talking about the reads. Uh, so the question is if um, if you say if more than five reads are, are you referring to total reads or to the reads supporting a certain SNP? And we're talking about the reads supporting a certain SNP, so at that particular position, right? So so it's only uh, per position, uh, uh, position uh, uh, status. Okay, so we will, um, continue um, answering and I see there are some answers already been uh, given by by Catherine so that or maybe somebody else if any of the uh, other outreach team members have joined as well okay so now I'm going to go ahead and um, demo some of these examples so I'm back in uh, in the browser and I'm just going to go to uh, toxoDB uh, I was looking at a gene before so I'll just go back here to the home page and so and I'll, I'm going to do um, in the next 15 minutes. I'll try and do three demos in three different databases. I'm going to use ToxoDB, PlasmaDB, and FungiDB as example cases, and then I'll switch it over to uh, Catherine so we can talk about copy number variation. So we have, um, uh, if you've attended our previous webinars, you will you would have um, learned more about the different searches we have on our databases. And so um, this left-hand panel includes all of our specialized searches. Um, and I know they're all divided into different categories, and sometimes it's hard to, to find ones because there's so many different things. So we have a, a nice filter box here, which allows you to find searches uh, very quickly. So I can go here and just start typing SNP, for example. And you'll notice now I can find genes based on genetic variation, SNP characteristics, right? So that's, that's one thing I may want to find. Or I may be interested in looking for SNPs, right? by comparing groups of isolates or within a group of isolates or based on a, on a gene ID. So if you have your own gene ID and you want to find all the SNPs that are in your in your particular gene, you can use this query or based on a genomic location, or you can also do it based on a, on a SNP ID. So each of our SNPs has its own ID and, and you can analyze this, the particular SNP by itself. And we'll, we'll demo all of these in a, in a few seconds. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go to our uh, genes by um, SNP characteristics, and we'll start with this search. So the question here is I'm going to find all genes in toxoplasma, which have um, SNPs. And I'm, in this case, I'm going to try and find SNPs, uh, genes that are highly um, uh, under high pressure to change. So they will have a large number of non-synonymous SNPs. And I'll show you how to set this up. One thing to notice is that when you come to uh, the SNP query, the first parameter at the top here is the organism parameter, and this allows you to uh, select the organism you're interested in, and this would be the organism where the, the SNPs were aligned to. And in most cases, for each of our databases, we have a particular reference organism where we align all the data to. It may not be your favorite strain, but nevertheless, it's, um, it, is, it is a very a closely related strain, and the strain that's, that's from a um, database perspective is considered a, a reference, not from a clinical perspective. So there's a good distinction here. And so in the case of, of ToxoDB, the, the strain ME49 historically was used as a reference just because it was the, the first strain that was fully sequenced and made available. And once I change uh, to ME49, you will notice here this um, um, uh, sample filter uh, section has changed and updated. Now there are 65 uh, samples that are aligned and I can go in and I can choose the samples based on the available information about the samples. So there's a lot of data in here. So I can, for example, um, go in here and look under the uh, samples or organisms. I can look under haplogroups. So in Toxoplasma, there's this, this notion of haplogroups. Typically, um, classically, there were, there were three haplogroups, but they've been expanded in, in more recent publications to 15 haplogroups. Uh, so you can go in and say, well, I'm interested in haplogroup one and two only, and I'm, I'm going to find SNPs that are present in genes based on haplogroup, based on strains that came from haplogroup uh, one and two. And you'll see here that it says seven of the 65 samples were selected. Um, I can um, move around through this filter. So for example, I can look at country right now, and you'll notice now that 
this is actually dynamic and it updates based on selections in the other filters. So now I can tell you that there was, you know, one of the one of the strains I selected came from Colombia, one from Costa Rica, one from the French Republic, and then three from uh, from the U.S. And so, uh, so this is actually a nice exploratory tool where you can go in and and quickly navigate and see what kind of data is there and what kind of information about the the samples is available. So in my case, I'm going to go ahead and and delete this filter because I'm interested in finding um, SNPs in all of the data that's available. So I'm going to select the 65 strains. And I want to find out specifically, I'm interested in non-synonymous SNPs. So let's keep scrolling down. And now you will be offered a number of additional um, options, right? And so let's start with the first one. So the first one is read frequency. Um, and remember when we um, looked at, um, go back to our presentation. So right here, so this is 100% read frequency. This is uh, for the A's, it's 40% read frequency because it's four out of 10 of the reads aligned. Um, and so in the case of toxoplasma, it's a haploid organism. And so in this case, we, you can pick 80% or higher, right? And I'll show you in, in another uh, database um, how you can actually change this. But in, in toxoplasma, in most cases, it makes sense to just uh, uh, select 80%. Um, for the minor allele frequency, in my case, I don't care. I just want to find uh, any kind of SNP, so I'm not going to modify the minor allele uh, frequency. Uh, but this is useful if you're trying to find rare mutations in a population, so you would you would set this to a, a um, lower number. And the next thing is to ask, well, how many of my isolates had a base call, right? So remember, I've selected 65 isolates, and the question is, you know, I can increase the stringency or decrease it. Right now it says, well, I only need 20% of my isolates to have a base call at that at any position that's being reported back to me, right? But I can be more stringent and I can say, well, I really want this to be 100%, right? And so, so you can, this may be too stringent and you get no results or it could be good enough and, and, and you'll, you'll go with that. So let's pick 100 for now. Um, I can go down and look at the SNP class. So if I look at the options, you'll see here there, I could look for coding SNPs, I could look for non-coding SNPs, I could look for non-synonymous, which are obviously coding, or nonsense, which will be in the coding sequence, or synonymous, which will be in the coding as well. Uh, in my case, I'm interested in non-synonymous mutations. Um, let's pick, uh, you know, how many of, how many non-synonymous mutations do we want per gene? This is the next question. And in this case, I'm gonna make it something really high. So I'm gonna pick 100. and for the rest of these, they're different. They're fairly self-explanatory, but if you click on these little question marks, you'll get more information about uh, these parameters. But you could really fine tune the type of um, genes or type of uh, SNP characteristics of a gene that you wanna, you wanna return, okay? And so let's go down here and let's go ahead and, and run this search. And so I already pre-ran the search beforehand. So that's why it shows up right here immediately. And it's also running again here in the, in the bottom uh, panel. But what I've done here is I, I basically started a, um, a search strategy and uh, it showed me that there are um, 574 genes uh, that were returned. So I must have had slightly different parameters. So let's go to my, my new search and forget the old one. And so I have 445 genes that had at least 100 non-synonymous SNPs in them from all the isolates, from the 65 isolates that are present in, uh, in the database. And so now you can go down and look at these and you'll see here that each gene is listed. And as you scroll to the right, I can go ahead and collapse this filter to make the window bigger. So as I scroll here to the right, it tells me this is on chromosome 7A. Um, this gene had over 2,000, almost 2,500 SNPs, so a lot of SNPs, and it had almost 1,300 non-synonymous SNPs, right? That's a huge number of non-synonymous SNPs, uh, in my opinion. Um, and then you can go down and look at it, and it's it's this uh, ubiquitin transferase gene, okay? And you can go down, there's a hypothetical gene right after that, and these are all genes that have really high non-synonymous SNPs. You can sort these different columns in different ways. So um, so if you wanted to, for example, look at SNPs per, per KB, um, so we can sort this and now um, sort of in the opposite direction, and so you'll see here, this is actually the gene that has the highest density of SNPs uh, per KB, basically. So even though it has a lower number of non-synonymous SNPs, they're still pretty high, uh, but it has, the density is higher, so it's a smaller gene, basically. And so that kind of uh, makes sense. Um, I can go and visit any of these genes. So if I um, go ahead and visit, uh, let's take the second one here and see what that looks like. And so, or 
whichever one I picked, but I picked one of these genes. So Toxoplasma gondii family A protein. Um, and I can scroll down here and this is the gene page. And you'll notice that different panels start loading as you scroll down. And you'll notice here there's a section for genetic variation. So I'm gonna go to the section and there's a genome browser view and your gene of interest is gonna be right in the center. So here's the Toxoplasma family A protein. And this is going to load here, and it's going to show you all the SNPs in this particular region. So this is a highly polymorphic region, right? And here's my gene, and there are different color diamonds. I'll go to the genome browser. Let me actually open this up in a separate window. We'll let this open up in the background, and then I'll get back to it, and I'll discuss what each of these diamonds uh, refer to. As you scroll down, you have a summary here of all the SNPs, and also um, you can uh, quickly do a multiple sequence alignment. So I can. I can select all of these samples and uh, run a multiple sequence alignment. I did one right before the call just to, because it takes a while to load all of these on the page and I don't wanna bore you with that, but you will get a, something like this. It looks very dirty up here. This is a bunch of information about the samples, but if you scroll down, you'll see a nice clean alignment. And as you go down, you'll, you'll see locations where there are differences, right? Here's a, a strain where, you know, there was no sequence, all the ends, you know, no sequence for this particular region, but everybody else had a sequence at this region and um, the red highlighting denotes that it's different from the reference, right? And so you can quickly scroll down and look at that. So if this is something you're really interested in that particular gene uh, to find, to see where the location of the SNPs are in a multiple sequence alignment, you can do it right there. Um, let me scroll back up. So as you know, I, I clicked on view in uh, JBrowse. So let's go back to the genome browser. So here's this protein A, um, and let me zoom in a little bit. So if you're interested in learning more about the genome browser, in this case, JBrowse is what we use. We have another webinar that's been recorded and on the webinar page. You can go and, and, and watch that and we show you how you can uh, navigate through the genome browser. But you'll notice there are all these different color diamonds here. So um, without um, knowing what they are, you can guess probably that these yellow ones are all non-coding, so they're not in the coding portion of the of the gene. Um, the blue and and uh, the dark blue and the light blue ones are most likely coding ones because they're in the in the gene. And there's a difference between them, right? So if you click on them, you'll notice that the dark blue ones are the non-synonymous um, mutations, and the um, uh, light blue ones are the synonymous mutations. Okay. So this will give you an idea of, of where the SNPs are in a particular gene. And of course you can zoom in and zoom out and look as, as you know, at larger or smaller sections. This is a, obviously an area of multiple um, uh, family A proteins. So this is probably a very hypervariable uh, portion of the, of the genome. Okay, so I'm gonna switch gears now and jump to uh, PlasmaDB. And what I'm going to do in PlasmaDB, let's go ahead and uh, close this and start from the home page just to get to your first start. Um, so instead of looking for genes with SNPs, I'm going to look for SNPs that distinguish between different groups of isolates. And so um, this query allows you to, uh, to find SNPs, for example, that distinguish, uh, uh, plasma, in this case, PlasmaDB, which has plasmodium, which causes malaria. Uh, I could be interested in SNPs that distinguish uh, isolates that were that came from East Africa to isolates that came from West Africa, or isolates that came from Africa compared to isolates that came from South and Central America, right? And so let's go ahead and try that. So what you can do again, you can you can choose different uh, species of Plasmodium that are available to you. In this case, we're interested in Plasmodium falciparum, so I'm going to keep it a Plasmodium falciparum. And you notice you can select set A isolates and you're going to compare them to set B isolates. Okay, so there are a bunch of parameters we have to set, but they're hopefully they're, you'll notice that there's a similar pattern as our previous search where you'll select the uh, frequency, the, the read frequency, and the percent isolates with, with a base call. And so those are things you can, you can modify. And of course, uh, the major allele frequency is another option as well. And so in this case, I'm going to go ahead and compare isolates based on geographic location. I'm gonna select country and let's go ahead and compare the South and Central American ones to, um, uh, to ones in Africa. So I'm gonna select all the ones here that I can quickly see that are in uh, South and Central America. I might miss some, but, the, but I think you'll, you'll get the point. And so let me scroll down to set B. I'm gonna select the geographic location, country, and now I'm gonna pick um, isolates that are in, um, in Africa. So let's pick, 
few of these. So there are many more African isolates, but that doesn't matter. There are many uh, more locations at least. There we go. So I think that's a, a good number. So you'll see there are 177 isolates from, from Africa, and I picked 30 isolates from uh, South and Central America. And now for set A and set B, I can, I can select some parameters. In my case, I'm gonna make sure the parameters are the same for each of them. So I'm looking for haploid SNPs. As I noted before, you can actually change this. Um, so one thing that, that there are a couple of things that could affect this, right? So one thing is the, the deployedity of the organism, right? So if an organism is deployed, uh, you know, uh, this question will be asking for, um, for um, uh, uh, SNPs that are present basically on both alleles of the deployed organism. Um, but you can imagine a scenario, in, especially from clinical samples, even if it's a haploid organism, but if it's a mixed infection, right, you can, you can see now results from that there because a mixed infection will look, let's say there are two strains in your infection, it'll look like a diploid uh, organism. And so that's something to consider. So if you know something about one of the isolates in there and you're trying to define if, it's, if it was a mixed infection, you can actually look for, um, use this parameter to, to actually look for that. Um, I'm going to keep the allele frequency at 80%. Um, let's change the, the isolates with base call to 50. So I want at least 50% of my isolates to have a, um, a call at the, any position that's returned. And same thing for my set B, I'm going to change this to 50 as well. Okay. And now we're going to get an answer. And so this will return all SNPs that distinguish uh, isolates from uh, South and Central America to uh, an isolates from um, Africa. And you'll see there are 459 SNPs that uh, meet this criteria. If you scroll down, now we were looking at SNPs. Each one of these represents a SNP. It tells you if it's in a gene, but not, not all of them are gonna be in genes. And I will demo very quickly right after this, I'll demo in FungiDB how you can actually um, combine a SNP result with a gene result, uh, which is quite useful for defining uh, lo the location of the SNPs. Um, each of the SNPs has its own record, so I can visit any of these uh, SNP records. Uh, so it'll show up here. It shows you the exact context of the SNP. Uh, there's a lot of information over the SNP, so I would encourage you to look at that. There'll be a genome browser view again that shows you the SNP location. But I think an important table as well here, you can again get an alignment of, the, uh, of um, um, that particular SNP location and you can select the different isolates you're interested in. Um, and another important table here is this table that shows you which um, isolates from which country and, and what um, SNP they had, uh, sorry, the strain sample, this table right here. It shows you all the isolates in the database, um, the SNP it had, what, what allele it had, and the frequencies and, and different information about them. So this is quite a useful uh, table if you're interested now, if you drill down into uh, specific uh, SNPs. So, and you can actually go and look at the aligned uh, uh, sequence reads for that region as well. I won't do that right now, just because it'll take a few seconds to load. Um, and I do want to make sure I quickly demo fungi DB before I turn it over to um, uh, to Catherine. So if I go to back to fungi DB and let's go back to the home page, uh, I'm going to look for SNPs, and I'm going to look for SNPs based on uh, within within one group of isolates. So I have a I'm going to look for what SNPs are within a particular group. Um, in this case, I'm going to switch from uh, Cryptococcus. I'm going to switch to Canada Auris. Uh, let's see what's there. So it looks like we have 132 samples that are available. Um, and let's, we can pick them all again for the purpose of, of demoing this. Uh, we can look for SNPs that are present in, um, let's pick 50% um, of the eyes. So let's pick 100. Let's see what happens there. Uh, So while this is loading, we'll let, uh, let me take a look at the questions. So there, there are a number of questions that are coming up based on um, based on uh, asking for the pipeline and stuff like that. So that's 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 good. Um, we'll also encourage you to look at the pipeline in our Galaxy platform, which uses Freebase, and um, and uh, that's available to you. And we have a whole webinar on Galaxy. And if you need more help, obviously click on the contact us link and let us know. Uh, notice I got zero results, right? So my, my search must have been too stringent. So, but I can quickly go back and revise this and say, well, you know, 100% was maybe too much. So let's go back to 20. Maybe I was being too ambitious here and let's let's see what happens. 
Um, and though sometimes these searches, you kind of, you'll have to fine tune them. You'll run it, you maybe make it too stringent, but then you can dial down the stringency. You might realize, oh, now I'm, I'm, I'm too relaxed. I need to go back and make it more stringent. The nice thing about this is that this is all um, done here on the on your laptop. You're not uh, wasting any reagents, so you can actually play around with this as much as you want. Okay, so now I found over you know 240,000 SNPs uh, among all of the the um, uh, Canada Oris isolates. You can see the SNPs here, where they're located, which gene, uh, and also you can see information about whether they're synonymous or non-coding and so forth. But now let's say I'm interested in finding genes where these they, they had a SNP somewhere in their upstream region, right? Because I'm interested in finding SNPs in regulatory elements. So I can add a step now. And now instead of intersecting my results, my, my uh, SNP results with other SNP queries, I'm gonna combine it with um, other entities in a database. In this case, I'm gonna use genomic co-location. So this is like a, a GPS, basically. If, if you know the location of all the cars in a neighborhood and the location of a particular house, you can co-locate them. You can say, well, find me all the blue cars that are hundred meters away from the blue house, right? Or whatever. And so if you have all that information, you can do that. And we're lucky because SNPs are positions on a, on a genome and genes are also a position on a genome. And so we can use this information like in a, in a, in a map for co-location, like a GPS coordinates. So I'm gonna add a step. I'm gonna look for genes based on uh, organisms because I'm interested in, in genes that are in Canada Oris because these SNPs were all in Canada Oris. And I'm going to um, filter my results to Canada Oris. And I'm going to continue. So you'll get this, but this is pretty self-explanatory. I'm going to return for each. And in this case, I'm going to return um, genes, okay, from my new step. And I want these genes, okay. I'm now going to characterize where do I want the SNPs to be found because I'm trying to co-locate these together, right? So, and I was interested in in genes who have a SNP somewhere in there, let's say upstream 100 nucleotides, all right? So I changed this to 100 nucleotides. You'll notice here now that I have this um, little portion here. That's where my SNPs are gonna be located. So I'm co-locating the SNPs and I want these SNPs to be located in the upstream 100 nucleotides of my genes, okay? And I'm gonna go ahead and run this. And so once you run this, you will get gene results and those genes will be all the genes that had SNPs um, in the upstream 100 nucleotides. So I'll let this run, but I'll, I think I'm gonna also uh, slowly switch over to Catherine to give her enough time to cover um, uh, genetic um, uh, uh, copy number variation. So um, Catherine, if you're ready, I will make you presenter. Yep. Okay, and um, as, as we're doing that, you know, don't, there's no, nothing to worry about about this result, but the bottom line is that you're gonna have a second step in your strategy and that's gonna show you gene, oh, there it is, it's done. So it, it returned uh, 4,380 genes that had a SNP in their 100 uh, nucleotides upstream of the gene. And then you can go down and look at the genes, okay? So let me go ahead and Catherine, make you the presenter. Okay. Um... Can you see my screen there? Yes, looks good and we yeah. can hear you well. Excellent, good. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a bit about the other thing that we do when we um, get DNA sequencing data, and that is look at copy number variations. Um, so I'm just gonna start out with a brief explanation of what they are and how we find them with our data. And then I'm also gonna do some demos with some of the sites to show you the data we have. And so, Copy number variations are a phenomenon where a region of the genome appears a different number of times in different individuals. So in the examples here, this is just a schematic. Um, we've got two individuals, a blue individual and a red individual. Um, the region could be a gene or it could just be a bigger chunk of the chromosome. And at the top, you can see that the region appears once in each organism, so there's no copy number variation. In the middle example, you can see that the, re the, the, the particular DNA gene, genomic region appears once in the blue organism, but twice in the red organism, so we have a duplication. And in the bottom example, it appears once in the blue organism, but it doesn't appear at all in the red organism. So in that case, we have a deletion. 
And there's quite a few different ways that you can look for these things. But the way that we do it is when we've aligned sequencing reads to a um, reference genome, like Omar talked about earlier. Um, oh, hang on, my slides aren't changing. Uh, there we go. Oh, sorry, I was going to talk about uh, types of um, uh, CNV first before I talk about how we look at them. So, um, as I said, the, the region of the genome can be, um, it doesn't have to be a single gene. It can occur on all sorts of different scales. So we can go from anything from polyploidy, which is where there's a duplication of the entire genome. And that's quite common in plants. It's also happened a couple of times in, in our own evolutionary history. We can have aneuploidy. And that's where you get a duplication of some of the chromosomes, but not all of them. And for anyone who works on Lishmania or Trypanosoma cruzi, you'll probably be quite familiar with that because it's very common in those organisms. You can get a segmental duplication, and that's where part of a chromosome duplicates. And one of the examples I have to show you today is an example of that in Candida auris. You can get duplications of a single gene. Um, and I'm going to look at an example of that later, which is the ROP5 gene in Toxoplasma. And you can also get very short copy number variations. Um, and those are duplications of short reads, which could either be inside a gene or outside a gene. Um, if they're outside a gene, they often don't have a phenotype. Um, but duplications of short regions within genes can have phenotypes. And quite a famous example is expansion of CAG repeats in, hunting, in Huntington's disease. So in our sites, um, because of the way that we have chosen to calculate CNVs, we can't really find full polyploidy, and we don't really have the sensitivity to find very short CNVs. But we can find examples of aneuploidy and segmental duplications and gene duplications. So I'm going to look at all of those this afternoon. So the way that we've chosen to look at this is to use sequencing coverage. And the idea behind this is that when you do whole genome sequencing, um, theoretically, you should be sampling evenly along the genome. So when you align your reads, you should get even coverage all the way along the genome. That's not quite true, and we'll see this a, a little bit later in a later slide. There's some minor variation, which is mostly associated with GC content, because when you do the library prep for your sequencing, GC rich regions amplify slightly better, and also just stochastic variation in sampling. But in general, you should see that the coverage should be pretty much even along the genome. So if you have a duplication, what you see is a region of increased coverage. And this is the way this works. So the red organism at the top is the organism that you've sequenced. And that has two copies of a region of the genome. The bars above this re represent the reads that have um, been sampled from all the way across this region of the genome. In the reference genome, there's only one copy of this gene. And so what will happen is the blue reads from outside the duplicated regions will just map here and here exactly how they should. Um, the green reads, map, which came from the left-hand copy, will map to the only copy that's in the reference. And the purple reads from the right-hand copy will also map back to the only copy that's in the reference. And so here, in this little region, you'll find that there's twice the number of reads that you would expect. And so when you see a region where the copy number, where, sorry, where the coverage is increased, that usually represents a duplication in your sample rel relative to the reference. And conversely, um, you see the opposite if you have a deletion. So if you have two copies of a lo locus in the reference, in blue at the bottom, and only one copy in the um, region that you've sampled, you'll still sample evenly from all the way along the genome, and the blue reads will map just as you'd expect to the um, single copy regions. The green reads that have originated from this one copy of the locus will be distributed evenly across both copies of the locus in the reference genome. And so the coverage there will actually be half what you would expect. So you'll see a decrease in coverage. 
it's quite important to say here that although that can be a, a, a copy number variation, it can be a deletion, there are other reasons why this could happen. So you have to be a bit more careful with looking at deletions than you do at looking at duplications. And one, one um, possible reason for this is if, you're, if this region of the genome is very variable, you might find that your sample is just too different from the reference and so the reads don't align very well and that can also um, uh, decrease the coverage. And so this is a real life example. This is um, chromosome one of Plasmodium falciparum. Um, this is not from our site, but it just gives you an idea of how this how this might look. And this shows four samples, um, three of which have a, 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 a are resistant to a particular drug, and two of those have a duplication in them. But um, this big section in the middle here. Um, you can see that the coverage here is pretty even all the way along the chromosome in this section. It goes up and down a bit, that's related to GC content, but the overall picture is quite stable. Over here on the left, we've got some other things going on. So right at the left-hand end of the chromosome, there's a variable region, and you can see the coverage is sort of up and down on, all over the place there, and that's quite typical. Um, that's partially because those regions are often not assembled very well in the reference um, and also the reads sometimes don't map very well e either. Then in the next region we've got lots of um, variable genes and you can see that the coverage has decreased here. So there may be something going on with the deletion in this region but actually the probable reason for this decrease in coverage is just that the genes here, these are RIFINs, are very variable and so the reads from the sample just aren't aligning very well to the reference. But over here, you can see a duplication and you can see that this is quite clear. And this is an example where this region that contains, I think, four genes has actually three copies in these two samples. And you can see quite clearly there, there's a very clear, oh, sorry, increase in coverage. Um, and it has quite sharp edges, which is also quite typical of a um, gene duplication. Um, and so that's what we're looking for. That, so what we've written our own software to do this and what it's basically doing is it's looking at the background coverage for the genome and then it's finding regions where the coverage is either higher or lower than what's in the background. And so in our sites um, we have a couple of different searches which I'll go through. We can search for supernumerary chromosomes in different isolates and we can search for genes with increased or decreased copy number in different isolates as well. And we also have some um, tracks in JBrowse. So I'm going to start by going to TriTripDB. And as I said in those slides, in Lishmania, it's very common for entire chromosomes to duplicate. And so we have a search we can use to find those. Um, so I'm going to search, I'm going to use this filter that Omar showed you earlier and search, uh, if I type in copy, you can see our copy number searches and there are three that show up. And in this case, we're looking for genomic sequences. Um, so I'm going to click on that one. And um, you can select the isolates you want to look at. Um, so this is in Lishmania and Phantom, and I'm just going to select these 11 isolates that have come from the sandfly here. Lishmania is diploid, um, mostly diploid, apart from obviously the aneuploid, aneuploid chromosomes. So to find the ones that are supernumerary, you want to find ones where the copy number is greater than, equal or, greater than or equal to three. So I'll change that. And we have this other parameter here. So here we've selected 11 samples and you can choose down here whether you want to find chromosomes where the median copy, median copy number over those 11 samples is greater than three or the other option you have is to find chromosomes where any one of these 11 has a copy number greater than three. And I'll, I'll, I'll come back to this in a minute. I'm going to set it back to median and then in a minute I can come back and show you the difference that makes. So if you run that search, this is with the median, you can see we have seven chromosomes that have come back. Um, 
they all have a median estimated copy number of three apart from chromosome 31 which has an estimated median copy number of four that's very typical in most leishmania chromosome 31 usually has at least four copies and actually in this case you can see that that's true across all of the 11 samples that we looked at if you want to find more rare um, aneuploidy events we can go back if i revise this search and change that parameter I was just talking about, the median or the by strain. So if I change that and run it again, now you can see we get 23 sequences come back, but quite a lot of these, they're only aneuploid in one or two strains rather than in six or seven or eight strains like these ones up here. Um, so how you use that really depends on whether you want to find very robust um, duplications or whether you want to find slightly more rare events. Catherine, is it, uh, sorry to interrupt, is it possible to make your screen uh, size a little bit bigger? Uh, there was a comment that it's it's uh, quite small. Is that better? Uh, maybe one more click. Or... Uh, Let's see. Yeah, I think that's better. Is that better? Okay, sorry yeah, about that. That's better. Yeah, no problem. It's great. Thank you. And also, Catherine, we, we are coming to the top of the hour, but uh, we can go a little bit longer. So if people drop off, that's OK. Since it's being recorded, we'll we'll make that available on YouTube anyway, if you have the time, obviously. Yeah, I've got the time, so I can just keep going. Great. Thank you. Um, OK, so we can look at some of these in JBrowse. Um, so two I'm going to pick out from here are chromosome 31, which is uh, aneuploid in all of these samples, and chromosome uh, Eight, no, sorry, chromosome 21, which is only aneuploid in this CUK8 sample. And so if we go to JBrowse, um, the, uh, uh, sorry, the tracks are under genetic variation here, and we can look at coverage in two different ways, but the best way to look at this is using these ones that say coverage normalized chromosome copy number, vari uh, chromosome copy number. I can just use this filter to um, to um, filter away the other ones so we can just look at these. Uh, I'm going to select those and get rid of the ones that weren't in our sample list. Um, and this is, let's look at the whole chromosome. So one of the things to note with these is when these tracks first come up, the scales are sometimes different. So you can see on the left hand side here, the scale here is four, uh, it's five on that one, it's five on that one. So it's sometimes helpful to rescale these. Yeah, see this one's scaled all the way to 10, so you can't really compare them. Um, find the ones I wanted to look at. So this is chromosome 21, and this is the one which was only different in CUK8. So if I change the one above to be on the same scale quickly, if you look at CUK8, which is this sample here, compared to the one above and the one below, you can see it's a bit difficult to see because it's all the way along the chromosome. But you can see that if you mouse over, you get values here. And these values are generally above 2, uh, to 2.7 there. It's going up to 3 around here. If you do the same on this one, you're down at sort of 1.9, 1. point something, uh, and the same on this one. So you can see that this one's actually got increased coverage all the way along the chromosome. Now, you probably wouldn't find that very well just from looking at JBrowse, so the search is really helpful in that case. Uh, but that's, that's an example of a aneuploid, for using the searches to find aneuploidy. Um, the next example I'm going to look at is in FungiDB. And here we're looking for a segmental duplication. We don't have a search that directly does that. Um, but what is very helpful for this is the gene searches. So here I'm going to use the genes by copy number comparison search. Um, and I'm looking at Candida. And I'm going to, sorry, select um, this strain, which I happen to know because I already looked it up, has a segmental duplication. And just for comparison, another random one that doesn't. And I'm going to use this by strain and sample 
um, comparison again. And what I'm looking for here is genes where the estimated copy number in the resequence strain is greater than the copy number in the reference. So if I run that search, um, you'll see we get about 400 or nearly 500 genes back. And obviously that's a lot of stuff to go to. But one of the things that's really helpful here is this genome view tab. So if I click on that, what this does is it highlights regions of the genome where and again, the if, you can, if you can zoom in, uh, Catherine, sorry to interrupt. Uh, it's kind of reset again, I think. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. Um, that's it. There we go. Yeah. Perfect. Better to interrupt so, you so we can see. But <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's fine. Um, so the genes, um, the, the marks on this gene view show you the locations of the genes that have come up in your search. And what's you can see most and for most of the chromosomes they're spread along the chromosome, but on chromosome two at the right hand end you can see there's a whole lot of genes, and the same here on the left hand end there's a whole lot of genes. Um, I don't really have time to look at it, but if you look at the search results you'll see that all of these hits are only in that one sample of five one o six, and we can go and have a look at that in JBrowse and you can see what's going on here. Uh, so if I select tracks again, and I'll just put in a quick filter for the copy number variation ones. Um, now, where's it gone? Oh, why can't I? Oh, there we go, 5106. And again, I'll pick a couple of other random ones just for comparison. If we go to chromosome two, which was the one with all those genes on the right hand end, um, you can immediately see here that we've got, this is the sample where we saw all those genes come out in the gene results. And this is these are two other samples for comparison. And you can see here, as, as I was saying in the slides, the coverage is flat almost all the way along. It's around about two and it stays like that all the way along in these two samples. But in here, it's around about two, it's around about two, it's around about two, and then it suddenly jumps up to four. Um, and that's the reason why we had all those hits. I'm actually not even looking at the whole chromosome here. Oh, sorry. All of those hits at the right hand end of the chromosome um, in, in that particular sample. It's not that the genes are duplicated, it's actually that the entire um, end of the chromosome is duplicated. So another quick example in ToxoDB, um, I'm going to show you the last search we have here. Um, so this is, the, this is the search just called copy number variation. And the difference between this one and the other search is that the other search looks for genes where the copy number is larger or smaller than the number found in the reference genome. Whereas this search just says, find me genes where the copy number is greater than whatever number you want to choose. Um, so here I'm going to pick strains from the Toxoplasma white paper. I'm going to use the median this time because I'm looking for genes that are um, uh, robustly, robustly have multiple copies. And I want to find genes where the copy number is greater than, equal of, greater than or equal to five. So just a quick note here, there's two things you can choose here, haploid number and gene dose. The haploid number is the number of copies per copy of the chromosome. So one copy of the chromosome has one gene on it and a single copy gene. The gene dose is the haploid number multiplied by the number of chromosomes. So in a diploid organism, for a single copy gene, the haploid number would be one and the diploid number would be two. Of course, in Toxoplasma, Toxoplasma is haploid. Um, sorry, it's haploid anyway. So the haploid number and the gene dose are actually the same. So I'm just going to leave that on haploid number. And I'm just going to quickly reorganize these. So we've got about 200 genes where the copy number is uh, greater than five. And you can see that if I, sorry, it's my screen reset again. If I scroll through these results, you can see that some of these aren't actually copy number variations. Is there a good example here? Um, 
Yeah, so here's one. This has one of the columns here is the number of copies in the reference, which is five. But actually, the predicted number of copies is also five. So this one isn't actually a copy number variation. It's just a gene that has five copies. In most cases, these are copy number variations. So in the example above, there's or the example below, there's one copy in the reference, and we predict that there's five in the um, in the sample. Um, what I wanted to look at quickly here were these three. Um, this one here, 30809, which is the ROP5 protein. So that's a protein that's secreted from toxoplasma. Um, it's a pseudokinase and it's associated with virulence. But if you look, you can also see that the two um, genes immediately above it, the data for them looks exactly the same. And the reason for that is that these three genes are orthologs of each other. And where we have orthologs, we pool data across all of the orthologs. And so a useful thing to do here is, so what with what this is saying is that in the genome, we predict in the reference genome where there's three copies, that's these three genes. And the pooled coverage across all of those copies is equivalent to five genes. So we think that there's actually five. Now, sometimes that's true. It is pooled across all three, and sometimes it's not. And a good way to check that is, again, to go to JBrowse. And so this is that locus in JBrowse. This is the ROP5 gene with the yellow highlight. And the other two are the two on, um, where are they? Oh, sorry, that's the ROP5 protein. I've got that wrong. Um, oh, no, it's not. Sorry. I'm confused. Uh, um, Ah, right, yes, okay, so that's one of the ROP2 family ones, that's the other one, right, yes, yeah, so this is the ROP5 and these were the other two um, orthologs I was talking about. But you can see that the peak in coverage here, which you can see in these four different isolates, is only actually on the ROP5 protein. So in this case, actually the coverage difference is not pooled across these three, it's actually just that the ROP5 protein is duplicated. And you can see that the degree of duplication is different in different samples. So here we've got two copies, here we've probably got four or maybe five copies, here we've got probably two copies, here it's probably three copies, um, there it's probably four copies. Um, so that's quite a clear example of what a single gene duplication looks at, looks like. Um, should I just quickly go through the last one as well, Omar? Sure, that sounds good. Yep. Yep. Okay, so the last example I had for you was in PlasmoDB. And I'm going to revisit the copy number comparison search again. So this is the one that compares the number of copies within, in an organism with the number of copies in the reference. And um, for this one, I'm actually just going to select all of the samples that we have. This is Plasmodium falciparum. I'm going to look for the median. So I'm looking for genes where the change is consistent across all the samples we have. And I'm, this time I'm going to look for genes where the copy number in the resequence strain is less than the reference. And if you remember in the slides, I said that this is it's something we can do, but it isn't always a, um, a, a deletion. Sometimes it's um, variable regions of the genome where um, reads from the sample just don't map very well to the isolates. Um, Sorry, let me make that bigger again. So if I go to this genome view tab again, you can again see that the hits from this search tend to accumulate in particular regions of the genome. So often at the ends of the chromosomes and then in these very discrete um, sort of boxes inside the chromosomes. And if you know anything about plasmodium, you'll know that the ends of the chromosomes tend to be where all the variable genes involved in um, immune evasion live, and that they also have some of these in internal locations. If you click on one of these boxes, it shows you the individual genes. And if you mouse over the genes, you can see what they are. And so this one is, this is um, PFEMP1, which is a VAR gene. This is variable surface antigen. A RIFIN, another VAR gene, another RIFIN, another VAR gene. Um, and if you look at most of these isolates, you see exactly the same thing. 
So in this case, what we're seeing is not actually, probably not actually a deletion. And I wanted to show you this for two reasons. But firstly, because that's something that's very important to be aware of. But secondly, because it is actually useful. If you wanted to find variable genes, this is actually a good way of doing it. And here you can find very clear groups of variable genes where we would expect them to be in plasmodium. Um, so that was the last thing I had to show you. Um, uh, I must hopefully been great. Keeping an eye yeah, on the so, questions. Is there any questions yes. I can answer? Um, I don't. I think we've answered everything so far. I think the one thing that I wanted to make sure um, to um, sorry about this over here. One thing I wanted to make sure to mention is that uh, if you have additional questions, uh, please don't forget to click on the contact us link, which is at the top of the page, and uh, Catherine can show you it's right under the the search panel. Um, I'm trying to see if there are any other questions that so, came. Yeah, sorry, the there. contact us link. Sorry, my mouse has gone a <laughs> Okay. Um, I'm going to take here. over. Uh, oh, okay, There's good. Yeah, contact us just, just, just here at the top. Okay, I'm going to make myself the presenter. Just show one more thing in the end. Yeah. And so, um, show my screen. So again, and as as Catherine showed, on any website you can go to the contact us link and let us know if you have additional questions. And then um, I wanted to make sure you are aware that we have a post webinar survey, which I already uh, linked in the. Um, uh, in the chat box and go to webinar so please click on it right now or scan this right now um it's we, we know from previous webinars if you don't do it now you'll never do it even though you're going to get this link tomorrow but we really appreciate your input uh let us know how we did and also let us know what else you would like to uh, learn about okay i think we've um reached the end there are no more questions uh thank you catherine a lot that was a great presentation and thanks everybody for um attending let me see there was one more question coming in uh, that was just a thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for joining. Um, and we will see you uh, next week. We have, as I mentioned, we have weekly webinars and please visit our webinar page. If you forgot where that is, just go under help, learn how to use ViewPathDB and go to webinars. And you will see that our webinar next week will be about proteomics data in ViewPathDB. So if you're interested in peptides, quantitative proteomics, or in post-transitional modification data, come in, uh, to our webinar next week. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Catherine, and see you online soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.